What's going on people? We are Tottenham TV back here for some more Ange content for you guys today and what we're going to be looking at is his career as a manager stemming from 1996 to the present day and he's had a lot of jobs, not going to lie, he's had a lot of jobs in uh, many different countries. He's gone from Australia to Greece to uh, Japan to Celtic and uh, with the national team with Australia as well. I said Celtic, but I yeah. mean Scotland. <laughs> um, but yeah, he's been at, in a few different countries. His first time in England now with Tottenham Hotspur. But um, he's won a lot of trophies in his time. And let's start off with his first job. Two years after retiring, he took the South Melbourne job, got promoted from being an assistant there, I think, for a couple of years. So he got the job and... Um, Albeit it was a very big success at, at South Melbourne. I think it was a seven-year trophy doubt or league drought for South Melbourne and he managed to win the league there. Yeah, he, when he won back-to-back -back leagues in his first ever job as a manager after he had to retire early, I think 27, um, due to a serious knee injury. But apparently when he was younger, he was always geared to becoming a coach. That was one of his goals, apparently, even as a player. And so it's no surprise that when he f took his first job at South Melbourne, again, it seems to be a theme, which we'll get, we'll get into later, but it seems to be a theme with him where he takes a club who are in a bit of disarray, they're a bit dysfunctional, and he gets them playing into, gets them into a cohesive unit. And um, yeah, he won back-to-back, -back, um, what's it called, uh, um, main, main league titles in Australia, which was an amazing achievement at the time. And to do it in your first job in management as well, it doesn't matter what level, it was very impressive. Yeah, and I think he also won, I don't know what relevance this is, but the, in 1999, the Oceania Club Championship and also took South Melbourne into the World Club, World, World Cup Club, whatever you want to call it, Club World Cup Championships as well. So he did have a really good stint there at South Melbourne in his first coaching role as well, which was super impressive. Mm. After that, he got the call from the national team or not the, the major national team, but the under 17s and the under 20s. And how did he get on there with the Young Socceroos? Um... It was interesting because he went into the job with the philosophy that he's coaching young players. He, he was um, given the remit to identify the next up-and-coming kind of Australian stars coming through. Um, but the other, a lot of people are surrounding him in the job, expected him to kind of... Um, be able to qualify for championships and World Cups even at the youth level and had a lot more focus on that. His focus was more developing the players. So in terms of results wise, he actually he he failed um, I think twice in a row to get the under 20s to the um, under 20 World Cup and that was seen as like a massive failure um, in, in the Australian Football Federation. But he himself didn't see himself as a failure in that job. He saw himself as actually doing the work for future generations of Australian football players and actually it paid off later which was talk about but um, it all, all basically culminated in this online on air TV interview with a very with a famous uh, Craig Australian Forster. pundit Craig, yeah, Craig Forster and it was uh, really if you have to watch it it's on YouTube and it was a really engaging uh, interview to watch where basically Craig Forster was calling him out for not qualifying con on consecutive occasions for the under 20 World Cup and saying he's a failure he should hold his hands up and admit that basically he's uh, failed in the job and should walk away he should basically calling for him to resign and he basically threw it back in his face saying you have no, you have no idea what you're talking about I'm not going to resign I know what I'm, what I'm doing in this job if you think you're so good essentially come and coach a team yourself if you think you can do a better job like I have confidence in my methods I'm here to basically bring the next generation of Australian youth players forward and I actually ended up getting him sacked that interview and he did I'm getting sacked very quickly but um, he ended up proving everyone wrong later on yeah, and they, they came back to him with their tails between their legs a bit later on. But after leaving and getting sacked from the Australian youth setup, he went and joined a Greek team, Pan Panachaiki, I think it's pronounced, in 2008. Didn't last long there, but why didn't he last long? Yeah, he was there for, uh, between March uh, 2008 and December 2008, so he was there for a few months. Actually, he apparently... Well, in terms of the job he was doing, he managed 33 games, won 16, uh, lost eight. But they were second in the league when he when he ended up getting sacked. And apparently they're on course for promotion. But um, 
uh, before um, he left. Apparently, there was some um, board uh, hierarchy politics at the club, which I'm not 100% sure of the 100% reasons why, but yeah, he did end up leaving and getting sacked from his job, even though they seemed to be doing well and he was on his way to promotion. And the reason he went to the Greece third division is because of the whole fallout of that on-air on interview with uh, Craig Forster uh, and his sacking, so ultimately sack, being sacked by the under-20, the youth level of the Australian national team. He was basically seen as a bit un uh, unemployable at the time. People didn't want to touch him. So he ended up going to uh, Greece um, because he was born there and, he, and he, whatever, he knew the country, he wanted to spend a bit of time there. And he ended up getting a job there. But for some reason or another, he, didn't la he only lasted eight months. And then he wanted to go back to Australia to continue his coaching career. Yeah, so that was in the Greek third division. Um, and then after he left there, after uh, not so many months, he did join a, C a team called Whittlesea Z. Zebras, as you can see, the black and white striped T-shirts in 2009. You can see why they named the Zebras. Yeah, but again, <laughs> didn't really last long. Yeah, this was a, ga a game. Again, he wanted, he was desperate to get back into uh, top level coaching in Australia. And no, again, similar to reasons why uh, he went to Greece. No one would employ him. He was seen as, a, as someone who couldn't be touched. So he basically took the only job he could get. And this was a, the team, which was his Zebras at the time, when he walked into the job. He, uh, they'd lost six consecutive games, so they were in complete dire straits. And um, they were a very young team, and they were kind of a, a massive mess. And it will seem as a kind of unrecoverable situation. And actually, his first game um, he had with them, they faced the, le the current undefeated league leaders at the time. They went away from home, and actually, they took the lead very early on and had a good game. But unfortunately, they conceded a goal in stoppage time and ended up losing. And he couldn't really find any form. He only lasted six games right. um, winning two of them so it wasn't a very they end up getting relegated um, in in uh, he didn't get sacked but he left um, on his own accord but they only, he, it was only after 16 games it was a relegation so you can say it was a blot on his copybook but at the end it, it was seen as a job that was doomed to fail essentially at the time it, it seems as though that kind of interview that he did when he was with the Australian setup did set him back quite a few mm. number of years to be honest because his first job was brilliant with South Melbourne and then he had a few jobs that didn't really go the way he planned from a footballing merit you know the under 20 and under 17 setup saying he didn't qualify for two World Cups the job in Greece didn't really go that well didn't last long Whittlesea Zebras was always a short term thing where he oversaw a relegation but it was in his next job at Brisbane Raw from 2009 to 2012 where I thought he really started to make that name for himself you know he he comes into Brisbane Raw and there was a lot of critics following him saying, you know, this guy's no good, this guy's going to be a failure. He asked the, the, um, the critics, to give him a year and see what he can do. Yeah, and he actually clashed with a lot of the senior players as well. There's a player I remember for his time in the Premier League, Craig Moore. He used to play for Newcastle. He was a senior player at the time. There was Danny Tiato. Do you remember him from uh, Manchester City? Um, another player who was kind of getting on a bit, and um, they needed basically a refresh. And he had a lot of clash with a lot of senior players. He kind of got them out and brought in a younger group of players to play the way he wanted to play. They were known as uh, Raw Salona, as we've heard yeah. um, um, from other Australian fans. And <laughs> Apparently, people still talk about this Brisbane Raw team as saying like it's one of the best or if not the best footballing side they've ever seen in that league. Yeah, and apparently he played amazing football and for two years, they um, basically won back-to-back -back league titles, the first ever A-League team to win back-to-back -back yeah. league titles as well. And it was seen as one of the great Australian uh, teams of their generation. And he was the one who brought that through. And this was like his basically... Because he was seen as an up-and-coming coach, the one who obviously won um, a double uh, two, two years in a row at South Melbourne. But then obviously, as we said, he had a few years in the periphery. But this was like his big return, essentially. And he got that return to Brisbane Raw and proved everyone wrong who wanted him sacked, basically, the Socceroos um, national team. And this was like his big kind of homecoming. And as you say, it was one of the best Australian teams. Ever. Yeah, and with back to back titles, he also qualified twice for the AFC Champions League as well. After leaving, he announced his resignation as, as Brisbane Raw head coach. He went and joined Melbourne Victory, another team in the A League from 2012 to 2013. He did sign a three year contract, so why was he only there for a year? 
He was only there for a year because he got the Australia job. Right. <laughs> and that's um, so he got off. Basically, he didn't win the league, a Melbourne victory. Um, I think he got to a couple of cup finals, but didn't end up um, winning anything, um, unfortunately. Uh, although, apparently, he was still very highly thought of and played some really good football again. And apparently, when he was let, when he did leave, like, they didn't want him to go, but they kind of reluctantly allowed him to leave because the Australian national job um, came to the fore. Um, but I think when this, when you're when you're Australian, I obviously it's too big of a job to turn down. So essentially, even though he was only halfway through his contract or so, um, he ended up jumping ship and they it's, allowed him to leave. It's interesting, isn't it? Because the Brisbane Raw, Melbourne victory, and later down the line at Celtic, he's had a history of rebuilding these teams, like getting rid of a lot of players right from the off, bringing in a lot of players as well right from the off. And that's exactly what he's going to need to do at Spurs mm. if he's going to have any sort of success. And actually... One of the players he signed for this Melbourne victory team is a former Spurs player in Space Delevsky. Do you remember him? I remember Space Delevsky, yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. We signed him once and he actually signed him for Melbourne victory. So I'm guessing we signed him off Ange Postelcoglu potentially. Um, I think it was a bit before that. We think we signed him before yeah, that. Yeah, I think Fair enough. That. But also, what is also um, I come to note is that he released Harry Kuehl from Melbourne Victory as well. So he's got a history of also taking out those kind of maybe big egos in, in a small pond kind of thing. Yeah, I think he. it's more about players who are coming to the end of their time, mm. yet they're still relied upon heavily. And I mean, I wouldn't say we necessarily have that at Tottenham, but we have a similar situation right now, which, uh, you know, we're very reliant on a certain amount of players, which may be we shouldn't be so reliant on and uh, yeah Melbourne victory that was the case and then when we, uh, we obviously went on to manage the Australian national team in a in in a 2013 and that was like the big thing from when he went to Australia is that basically they were very they were reliant on a core group of players who had been aging um and were and basically didn't have it in them anymore but they, they were called the golden generation from 2006 they had like mark viduka harry kill these kind of players and they were very reliant on him and basically they needed someone to task to bring through the next generation of australian football and and the and who's the perfect person but the guy who was youth team manager through two when in 2007 so he knows who these players are and mm. he brought them through and he had a lot of success uh, with Australia got them to the 2014 World Cup didn't obviously win any games but but you know they they really um, were kind of uh, how do you call it um they were not the moral victors, but like they, they set the stage with a lot of their performances. You know, their group was Spain, Netherlands and Chile. Yeah. Like was... they were massive, massive, massive underdogs in that group, you know, and they actually had good games. They and lost, they... I remember Holland 3-2, I remember. I remember that game. Tim Cahill scored an, um, one of the goals of the tournament. And um, apparently in that game as well, they had more possession than Holland, which is like unheard of like yeah. back then. They lost 3-1 to Chile, 3-2 to Netherlands, and then they lost 3-0 to uh, Spain. But what, what was known about this Australian team in that World Cup, what we know and what we've spoken about Ange Postacoglu with a lot is that he doesn't change his system, doesn't change his philosophy for no one. So they went into that World Cup with completely no fear. They went and attacked teams and attacked teams. And yes, they might have conceded quite a few goals in that World Cup, but I think they did capture the hearts of their nation at that World Cup. Yeah, and it showed, that, and apparently at the World Cup, it was like showing that there's a, there's a, there is a future generation of Australian footballers that can be relied upon. And that was like one of the proofs of it. And then in 2015, his big success was for the first time ever he won Australia their first ever Asia Cup which, yeah. was, um, which was an beating incredible incredible achievement when you think about it yeah beating South Korea in the final is no mean feat because yeah. you've got to say like South Korea are a bigger footballing nation than Australia I would mm. say and was Hume Min Son in the team at that time was that probably a bit too early for him 2015 probably a very young was he at Hamburg at that yeah, time he just joined Tottenham oh he just joined Spurs so yeah he would have been hmm or, or, or probably a, but a Leverkusen. Um, but the, the, yeah, winning the Asia Cup, which is basically the equivalent of winning the Euros or the Copa America for that region, yeah. um, was, an, uh, was something against all the odds and was an amazing achievement. Uh, on their way to it, they actually beat Kuwait and Oman in the group stage. They actually lost to South Korea in the group stages, 1-0. And then, but they got through to the knockouts. They beat China 2 0. They beat the United Emirates 2 0 in the semi. And then in the final, they re met South Korea, who they lost to in the group stage. And then they beat them in the final 2 1. Extra time, yeah. Um, which is an un unbelievable achievement. And to think about, yeah, Australia winning the Asia Cup, like no one would have thought probably beforehand they had a chance. And Postacoglu proved everyone wrong yet again. 
Absolutely. And then after that, he did um, qualify successfully to the next World Cup in 2018. But he left the national team before um, they got there to the World Cup. And he went on to a brand new um, a brand new adventure out in Japan and took over Yokohama Marinos from 2018 to 2021. And um, I believe that they were like trophyless or didn't win the league for like 15 years mm -hmm. or something like that in the Japan League. And he went there. And again, rebuilt the team and won the league. Yeah, and his first, he was there for two seasons. The funny thing is, in his first season, when he took over, there was serious threats of relegation and it looked like they were going to be in big trouble. Um, and it seemed as though it was a big job just to keep them up. He ended up keeping them up. They finished 12th in the league. And not only did they finish 12th, but they... they had ended, ended the season with the third most goals out of anyone in the league. And got to the cup final and as well. And got to the cup final in their first season. So it, it seemed clearly they were on the right path. And apparently he got, um, after his first season, he got offered the Greek national job. Yeah. And he certainly turned it down to stay at, to stay in Japan and see his job through. And then in his second season, after taking over a team in his first season, threat relegation, they went on to win the league in the second season. And having done that, became the first Australian to win a Japan league. Which is, which is <laughs> an unbelievable achievement as well. And also, as you say how many Australian managers have there been yeah, in the Japan League before that question. <laughs> um, but as you say it was their first title as well in 15 years to do it in the fashion like after getting them saving them from relegation and then winning their first league in 15 years is something which is quite incredible when you how you think about how difficult that must be to do yeah and even though it's in the Japanese league like that's an incredible achievement yeah I think like no matter what league you're in if a team haven't won the league in that many years like it's going to be an achievement to get them back to maybe what they were that many years ago. Like 15 years is a very long time. So um, I think it's an incredible achievement. And then um, you fast forward to his latest job at Celtic, 2021 to 2023. And what an incredible job he did at Celtic. He was being laughed out of the room uh, from all the pundits, from Rangers fans from a lot of Celtic fans as well. They were doing campaigns saying um, they don't want Ange Postacoglu as their manager. Who is this? Nobody coming in. And also they just lost out on Eddie Howe as well. So it was like uh, they yeah. really wanted him and they just lost out on him. Yeah, and they're like, who, who the hell is this Ange Postacoglu guy? Who is he? And um, he came in. He got rid of, I think he signed 14 players in his first transfer window for Celtic. Uh, complete regeneration of the squad. And you've got to remember as well, the year before that, before he came, Steven Gerrard had just won the league with Rangers, unbeaten the whole season, bringing Rangers back to where they belong. Rangers really dominated that league that year. And he brought Celtic exactly back to where they wanted to be. Won the double in the first season, won a treble in his second season, and it pretty much couldn't have gone better as well. The football that was on show from Celtic as well, scoring so many goals. I don't know how many they scored in the first year. In their second year, they scored over 100 goals, like crazy amounts of goals Celtic were scoring and yeah maybe they did concede a few many goals but even still like I think before where they went off the boil it was only 25 goals conceded so it's not that many I guess yeah and again just like uh, you, it's a theme at every club is like a rocky start before his methods get implemented and he's able to get a really cohesive family uh, feel within the team and a real attacking structure scoring lots of goals and even though they got knocked out very early on in the Champions League playoff to Mitchell in his in his first season um, he was, uh, and even he lost his first game as well. And it was a rocky start. People were thinking, you know, has this guy got it? But apparently, in his first old firm derby um, that he managed, he went in. They went into it playing uh, Giovanni Brown Broncos managed Rangers, who were unbeaten in I think 14 games going into it. So looking really strong. And Celtic went and wiped the floor with them in that game. And basically, they they took top spot in that game, and they never let it go. Essentially, and they never really let it go. For, for literally two years um, after that moment. And I think that was when they really started to believe this guy is, um, um, he is the real deal and they're ready to buy into him. And he, as you say, they won the double in his first season, second season as well, they won the treble, but in the Champions League, they did get knocked down in the group stages. But I remember watching games when they played Real Madrid and it wasn't for the want of like making chances or anything like that where they lost those How games. many open goals did they miss that game? They, they created, especially at nil-nil, they created so many chances. Like if they had more quality, they definitely would have got at least a couple goals um, in that game. And Real Madrid kind of rode the storm. Uh, second half, they ended up scoring three goals in 
and it was um, that was kind of the end of it. But if you watch that game, right, Celtic were not out of tactics; they just didn't have the quality on the day, and that shows maybe how his tactics can go toe to toe with the vest. And became the first Australian manager to win a Scottish League, back to back manager of the years as well uh, with Celtic. So I mean, his time at Celtic pretty much could not have gone any better unless he won a treble in his first year instead yeah. of the double. That's the only thing that you could say where it could have gone better. But I think like when you're looking at, at his managerial career, great start with South Melbourne, a rocky patch in the middle there. But then as soon as he went to Brisbane Raw, it just went up and up and up and up and up. And that's culminated in all these events of him getting a job at Tottenham Hotspur. And I think it's an amazing story, actually, when you look at his career, because starting out again retiring from a from a very uh, you know retiring early at 27 then winning the double in your first coaching career then being written off from everyone getting sacked by the Australian youth team and getting written off seeing as unemployable and then coming back into Australian football winning the first ever back to back for the A league and then going on to win um a league with a relegation threatened Japanese team and then winning a treble uh, winning five trophies in two seasons in Scotland um, just proving everyone wrong, having that inner self-belief, you know, going on air and battling pundits and having that self-belief within, but then being able to to not let it get you down even after you got sacked and have that, but still have that belief and prove everyone wrong time and time and time again. It's, as you say, it's Celtic, everyone, no one wanted him and he proved everyone wrong yet again. So coming into this Spurs job, I don't think there's anyone better equipped when it comes to that side of the game, like not caring what anyone thinks of them and um, doing things his way and and having that self-belief that he can be a success, I, I don't think there's anyone better equipped than right now than him who would have that belief in themselves uh, to prove everyone wrong. We've spoken about in the past, like maybe Antonio Conte when he joined, you know, we know that he only spends a tenure of two, three uh, years at a club, but we kind of like battled it and said, you know, maybe he could see a project happening here at Tottenham and maybe he can stay uh, for a good four or five years and oversee a project. As well as um, Conte, and Postacoglu also doesn't stick around at teams for too long because like a good offer always comes around the corner for him. So do you think that's a worry for you? If he might, does maybe. well? Maybe, it might be. That might be something to think about in the future. But I think at the moment, um, in terms of a better job, I mean, how many, Spurs are a very good job. We're near the top of the tree. So unless you're, he's going to like a Man United or a Man City, which you never know, maybe he'll get, maybe he get, oh, gets off of those jobs. But I do think Tottenham are pretty good position right now in terms of getting him getting better jobs if he does that well um but i think he might not need to we not might not need to see it as a project of five years i think even if he is for two here for two or three years and he just gets us back on the right path gets us playing good football again and builds a structure at tottenham maybe that's all he needs to do to be a success here he might not have to be this large five-year project but he still doesn't look he does seem to be like the character, although he does leave, he has let fairly quickly in a lot of his jobs. I think I th there might be an opportunity here for him to find a home at Tottenham because it is such a big club. It's definitely the biggest club he's ever managed. And, I f and also it's his biggest challenge as well. And to think about if he was to be offered the job at a bigger club than Tottenham, he would have to like be challenging for a league at Tottenham. That, that, that's, that's probably where it'd have to be. And if he's doing that... I wouldn't have any complaints. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. And, you know, he was the first um, Australian to win a Japanese league, first Australian to win a, Celt to win a Scottish league, first Australian to win back-to-back -back leagues in the Australian league as well. He's the first Australian to manage in the Premier League as well. Is he going to be the first Australian to win a Premier League as well? Who knows? Nothing stopping him at the moment. Let's see Watch how the story space. exactly. Let's see how the story unfolds uh, when he takes his role from July the first. But that is the story of Ange Postecoglou. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. Like, subscribe, and comment. And as always, come, come on, on you Spurs. Spurs.